Good morning. Good morning. Uh, can you hear us okay? Um, way at the back. Can way you... at the back. Uh, it's, we're in the parking lot, but people are further away than they even are in the sanctuary. Um, <laughs> but it's so good to see so many of you with us. Um, uh, welcome to Kezprez. Whether you're joining us online or here in person, we're so glad that you're here. So welcome, welcome. So thanks for being here. Um, a few announcements as we get started. Last week was such a great experience for us, uh, just to be able to see one another, not to have to wear masks, and to be able to sing. I didn't realize how much I'd missed singing and hearing other people sing. And when we started singing last week, I completely choked up because it was so powerful. So uh, we just decided to keep this going for as long as we have good weather and uh, can weather the weather. So uh, it's good to be outside together. So uh, that's the plan going forward for now is to meet outside during good weather on Sunday mornings. Thank you for those who signed up for Eventbrite. That's uh, an easy way for us to know who's coming and how many people are coming and keep a record for contact tracing. And so we'd encourage you to do that. And if you don't uh, feel comfortable using Eventbrite, you can always just send an email to Kirk's address, minister at kezprez.ca, to let us know that you're coming. Um, also, so thankful this morning to have a Grow Kids program beginning again. Uh, thanks to Alex and Michelle, and I think Petra's helping out with that this morning also. Uh, so um, after the kids' time, the kids will go off with Alex and Michelle and Petra and uh, have, a, have a time together. So that's also a great addition. So thank you so much for that. And then um, coming up, uh, early October, we're looking forward to starting our Grow Women, Grow Men, and the Tuesday Afternoon Bible Study Group. So if any of those groups interest you, uh, we're doing things in a, a variety of ways, some online, maybe some hybrid. Um, but if you're interested in connecting with one of those groups, you can speak to Kirk or I, and uh, we can direct you with that. I think that's it. Let's uh, get our hearts ready for worship. So if you didn't pick up a sheet yet, you can pick one up because I'd love to hear you singing with me, but chances are uh, you know the songs well. Let's stand as we worship. We haven't done that too much lately. Because this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Everyone needs compassion. Love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior, and the hope of nation. Savior, He can move the mountain. Jesus, 
Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Jesus Messiah. Jesus Messiah. Name above all names. Blessed Redeemer. Emmanuel. Messiah, Lord of all. All our hope is in you. All our pray. God, we thank you for this glorious day, for the, the wind and the rain and the sun. We've gotten it all this morning. And yet you are the God of all those things, and you are the God of us, your church. So as we gather, it doesn't matter whether we are surrounded by walls or in the beauty of your outdoors, you are present with us. So God, fill our songs. Be Empower our words and unite us as your church as we pray together the prayer that you have taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Um, we have a number of kids here today, and um, so I have a question for you, and, and you need to speak really loud because I, I, can, I can't hear you as well as you can probably hear me, but who here has chores or responsibilities or duties to do around the house. Can you can you raise your hand? Even some adults did. So I was thinking of that uh, today. So for example, um, Allison does all the washing of clothes at our house, and then uh, Lily and I fold and put them away. Fold. <laughs> fold. <laughs> Fold <laughs> and put them away. Um, um, so Allison mops the kitchen floor and things, and I'm the vacuumer. 
around the house. So I do the vacuum. Okay. Um, Allison does most of the cooking. And uh, usually Lily kind of takes stuff off the table and puts it in the dishwasher. And usually the next morning Allison um, takes it out of the dishwasher. So I, I give the dogs water and Allison feeds them. So we, we have all kinds of responsibilities, duties to do around the house. And they're all kind of divided up. And, but I was thinking of there are some responsibilities. In fact, there's really one responsibility that neither of us are responsible for. Um, and that's the word savior. None of us are responsible for saving the other person or being the other Messiah to someone else in the house, just as we aren't at the church here either. We're not Kez Prez's savior, nor are we Kez Prez's Messiah. That job, that chore, that responsibility is for Jesus alone. And sometimes we forget that. When sometimes we try to help other people, and it's good to help other people, but sometimes we think we're to come in and to save them and that's God's job. That God does that and Jesus does that a lot better than you or I ever could. So I need you to remember that this morning, okay? So let's pray and then you guys are going to go around the corner outside and uh, enjoy some time with Petra and Alex and Michelle, okay? So uh, let's pray before you guys go off. And can you repeat after me? Can we say, thank you, God, that you love us. Thank you, God, that you love us. Thank you that you are our Savior. Thank you that you are our Savior. Be with us. Be with us. Help us to love you. Help us to love you. With all our heart. With all our heart. With all our soul. With all our soul. With all our mind. With all our mind. With all our strength. With all our strength. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite uh, Maria to come now and to read and... While she's on her way, just if you're at home or if you're with us this morning, we'd encourage you to bring your own Bible with you, whether you're at home or here, Genesis chapter 3, and I'm going to invite uh, Maria to read it for us. <coughs> now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of any fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and, and among wild creatures, Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his feet. Let's pray. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock <clears throat> and our redeemer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite uh, Charity and uh, or uh, Catherine to come up. We're going to try in Christ alone together. I just remembered. Sorry. There are four boys in the McLeod household. There's, uh, there's Brian the horseman. There's uh, Kevin the musician. There's Kent the athlete. And then there's mom's favorite. <laughs> Two of us look like McLeods. Two of us look like Donalds. There's nine years that separate the youngest from the oldest. There's sometimes confusion, um, especially in our younger years when my mom would go through the entire roll call when she was looking for one person but she wasn't sure exactly who she was looking for. And then later in years, we would um, run into people that we hadn't seen for a while and they would say something like, oh, I thought you were Brian. Or on the phone, they would say, you sound so much like Kevin. 
But in terms of the oldest, there is no doubt. Brian is the oldest because he was born March 7th, 1958. It's a little harder when we try to do that with the Gospels. I say Gospels because there are four, as you know, four different books that tell the story of Jesus. Now, if you didn't grow up in the church and you're reading the Bible for the first time, you might wonder, why are there four? Even, in fact, if you, if you grew up in the church, you probably ask, why did this happen? It's a question posed in the book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, by co-authors Fee and Stewart, and they answer it by saying, after all, there aren't four Acts of the Apostles. Moreover, the material in the first three Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they are nearly so alike that they're often called the Synoptic Gospels. That's common view Gospels. Indeed, one might even wonder why even keep the book of Mark, because it's so brief and everything in it is in Matthew and Luke. In fact, the only parts that are specific to Mark could be written on a page at the very most. But there are four Gospels, and that's part of their genius, continues Fee and Stewart. But remember, these books didn't begin as books, but oral stories told from one generation to the next. Verbal stories told around the kitchen table, verbal stories told while they were walking along the road, verbal stories told at bedtime to children. And although these early Christians and their ancestors were first and foremost part of an oral culture, the passing of time has a way, doesn't it, of forgetting the stories or not telling the stories. And therefore, the stories are often lost. So people began writing them down and other people began compiling them and still others included stories that they thought were more pertinent to their audience and others wrote more to another audience, so to speak. That could be the reason why Matthew, for example, speaks so much about kingship and uh, Mark is so brief and Luke is so detailed. Now, you might think that the order of the Gospels is the chronological order, that is, by date. You know, Matthew being first, as Brian is first in our family, that Matthew is the oldest, but that's not the case. They're not dated in order. Most scholars believe that Mark is probably the oldest, because of his recollections of Peter. Remember Peter in the opening verses and chapters of Acts because of Peter's preaching and teaching. Luke and Matthew then used Mark as a primary source and then they used other books, other stories were sure that probably no longer exist. This is just one of the reasons that most reliable biblical scholars have Mark as the earliest. Written around 66 AD, or about 30 or so years after Jesus' death, and then Matthew and Luke, penned in the early 80s, and then John, the baby of the family, penned around 90 AD. Now there are other dating methods, but let's say that Mark is the oldest. Mark is the Brian of our family. It's the oldest gospel, or is it? If you were with us last Sunday 
Allison introduced to us a new series that we're doing. Or if you received recent email blasts or saw the Instagram post or the latest Facebook post, you would know that we're planning on, on doing something for the remainder of 2021 and then even into 2022 to see if we can actually see Jesus in every book of the Bible. To see Jesus in every book of the Bible. And now that you know how the story ends, as Allison said last Sunday, and now that we're looking in a rear view mirror, as it were, to see exactly where the Gospels began, we also see where Jesus is first seen, or at least is first foreshadowed. Because it's not like we're going to be looking for Jesus' name in the book of Exodus, or looking specifically at Jesus' teaching in Hosea, or Jesus' presence in Timothy. But we are going to see that we can actually see Jesus in every book of the Bible. Because every book in the Bible points to Jesus. So, what better place to begin than at the beginning? In the very first book, the oldest book. And in fact, it's really the first gospel. Allow me to explain. The, world, the word gospel, as you probably know, literally means good news. So if that's the definition, then I guess we could say anything that's good news is gospel in the broadest sense. Like, I found my lost keys, gospel. Or I got that job, gospel. Or the, jo or the Jays are in the wild card race, gospel. <laughs> But in the truest biblical sense, gospel refers to the good news of God's redeeming plan. The good news of God's redeeming plan. Now remember, this past summer, if you were with us a little or a lot, you would know that we looked at God's plan Creation, fall, covenant, law, exile, incarnation, salvation, grace, mission, and recreation. Or the story of how God took something that went terribly wrong and made it wonderfully right. And the role that Jesus would play how something was so terribly wrong was made wonderfully right in the role that Jesus played. But it's not as if God's Jesus plan, that gospel, was first introduced in Mark, but long before that. Although Mark might be considered the first New Testament gospel, by explaining the nature of Jesus' Messiahship as well as Mark's concern with the suffering of the Messiah. As far back as Genesis, do we see this story of a suffering Messiah in chapter 3 that Maria read? You see, the first time the Messiah was foreshadowed is actually in the book of Genesis. In fact, it's in Genesis chapter 3. Derek Thomas alludes it's crucial and definitive in all of Scripture, lest John 3.16. Although Genesis 3 may be more well known for the fall of humanity, or as Tim Keller says, it explains the root, that is the root of sin, where it all began and where we got to this mess that we are now living in, along with the result, the roots and the result of sin, that is 
the punishment of Adam and Eve and even the serpent, and we live with that punishment, we also see in Genesis chapter 3, in one verse, a remedy. The roots, the result, and the remedy, where the gospel is first introduced and where Messiah is first foreshadowed. Because Genesis is not simply the oldest book in the Bible, it's also the first gospel. In the midst of roots and results, there is remedy. When we read, and I will put enmity, that is division, between you and the woman and between you and your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Genesis 3, verse 15, has been called, at least by Walter Kaiser, the Proto-Evangelium. Proto, meaning first, and Evangelium, meaning gospel. The first gospel. Because it was the original proclamation of the promise of God's plan for the entire world. It gave our first parents, Adam and Eve, a glimpse of the person and their mission of the one who was going to be the central figure in the unfolding redemption of the world. The he, or the seed, or the offspring, is mentioned in Genesis 3. That seed becomes the root on which the tree of the old promise of the Messiah grew. Or as Derek Kidner writes, it's the first glimmer of the gospel. Or De Roche and Meyer claim it's the seedbed of the messianic hope. Think of how much time passes before God's plan comes into fruition. It's almost immediate. There is the sin, there is the punishment, and then there is the messianic hope. It takes God very little time following what could be considered humanity's worst moment to provide humanity's greatest hope and give the world its greatest gift. Into this seemingly hopeless situation, God announces punishment upon the serpent. In the presence of Adam and Eve, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Although it may sound odd in the midst of all of this, Verse 15 refers to the woman's seed that is a descendant. Given the context in which the serpent had just deceived Eve and therefore brought the curse upon creation, it's quite fitting that the seed will be responsible to bring punishment, but also to take punishment. To attack the serpent, but also to receive punishment punishment in return. So what do we know? Or who do we know? The seed of the woman will attack and be victorious, but will also suffer. It's kind of like the children's story that I know we've shared before of trying to get the kids to say squirrel when they ask what chirps and what eats nuts and what is has a furry tail and the little boy said it sounds like a squirrel but I know the answer is supposed to be Jesus. <laughs> the answer is always Jesus and the same is true here. The punishment would destroy evil. It would restore creation back to what it was in Genesis 1 and 2 and it would allow God to dwell with his people as he did with Adam and Eve in chapters 1 and 2. 
All three of these themes are alluded to in just that one verse. But not just in Genesis, but throughout all of Scripture. Every book of the Bible, because every book of the Bible points back to Jesus. Now remember, we know how the story ends. And remember I told the children how the story ends is God wins. God wins with Jesus apparently losing. But when you know how the story ends, you can look back with new eyes. Even the ancient patriarchs who read this verse understood the promise of Genesis 3.15. Although they did not have the benefit of looking back or having 2020 hindsight, as they say, nor knowing that it would be Jesus, they knew that a seed would come to one day be victorious but also receive a great punishment. They knew of this proto-evangelium, the first gospel, and it gave them hope. Hope for generations. Hope for decades. Hope for centuries. A great hope. That God's restorative, God's redemptive work, God's fulfilling his plan would occur in the life of Jesus and was announced as far back as Genesis chapter 3. Jesus would come and defeat evil to restore creation and in the end not be willing to simply become victorious but suffer great defeat on our behalf, for us. That is the first announcement of the gospel and the first place where we meet Jesus, that even Genesis points to Jesus. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for your word that brings life. But even more that your word that points us to Jesus, because when we see Jesus in your word, in every part of your word, we begin to see Jesus everywhere, even in our lives. May we see him and may you give us eyes to see him, we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen. As we uh, come to our time of prayer and a time of offering, I forgot to say this last week, but if you're with us this morning and you have offering that you would like to contribute, there's a brown kind of woven basket on the table at the back that you can just drop your envelope or your cash or check or whatever into that basket and uh, George is here and we'll pick it up later. So thank you for that and thank you for those of you who are continuing to support Kesprez through a wide variety of means. Um, hopefully you were able to receive a financial update from the end of August that went out by email this week and we're just so uh, grateful for the support that we've been given and um, the opportunities that we have to continue to share in this ministry together. Um, as we come to prayer, um, we continue to encourage you to send prayer requests to us through Facebook or through email. Um, and if you're here with us, and, um, feel free to share them with us. You can share them uh, in a minute, or you can mention them to Kirk and I following worship. Some of the folks that we've been praying for this past week are Blaine and Anne and their children, for the Foot family, for Robin, for Melinda, for Mary, for Sharon and Russell, for Susan and her mother Rosemary, 
And uh, we would really appreciate your prayers for uh, Lily and Kirk and I over this uh, coming week as Lily and I travel to the UK where Lily will go to university um, the coming year. And as we go through a, we all go through a transition together. So we covet your prayers for safe travels and for that transition time. Are there others that uh, you want to, us to include in our prayers this morning? Anybody that's here? Yeah, Verity. Okay, thank you for sure, Michelle. Others? Yeah, Sandy? For Matt. For Matt, yep. Others? Yeah, if you're watching online, you can continue to include them in the Facebook comments or send them to us by email. Let's come to God together in prayer this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks for this time together and thank you for the opportunity to be outside and uh, for some of us to see one another face to face and for others to join online and uh, still feel a part of being together in worship. Thank you for making ways possible for us to gather during this uh, difficult time. We give you thanks for good news this week, God, and for um, schools reopening and uh, children being back together in classrooms. And we pray for teachers and school staff and kids and anxious parents for all of those times of transition. We give you thanks, God, for the reminder of this week of uh, the election coming here in Canada. And we give you thanks that we have the opportunity to vote. Although there may be a lot of rancor and unrest, God, we thank you for the freedoms that you provide for us here in Canada. And we are mindful of places around the world that don't have the same freedoms that we do. And we ask that you would help us to be responsible and to be grateful. Father, we continue to pray for those who are struggling, for those uh, businesses that are struggling uh, with the many transitions and now struggling to find workers. We pray for those households that have been affected either by COVID um, illness within their own household or the lingering effects of the downturn in the economy and financial concerns, concerns about school. We pray for those who uh, are still feeling isolated and very much alone, and we think especially of those who are in hospital and in long-term care facilities, and for the ones who care for them. God, we give you thanks for your church, that your church is not bound by four walls, that your church does not fold or buckle under the pressure of a pandemic, but in fact, God, sometimes this is when our faith really comes alive, when we realize how little control we have and how desperately we need you. And so we pray that you would raise us up, God, that you would raise up a mighty army that you would strengthen our faith and that you would breathe the fresh breath of the Holy Spirit into our hearts and into our voices, that we might be uh, those cities on a hill, those lights in the dark, that you would make us shine for you. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. If you... Uh... Have a sheet, grab uh, your sheet or follow along on the screen as we sing the last song together.
alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope and no place to live again. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us this day and forever grant us his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you again to those who joined us here. Um, we are going to be here uh, next Sunday and next, as Allison said, for the next few Sundays to dress accordingly. Uh, we know it's a little chilly, but um, uh, we're a tough breed here, at least uh, <laughs> Maritimers are, right, Andrea? So we have to teach a few lessons to these Ontarians about toughness. But uh, it's good to be together, and uh, we look forward to uh, joining with you again next Sunday. Thanks for being here. Um, as you go this morning, we pick some fresh vegetables from the garden. So please help yourself. There are some beets, some peppers, some onions, and lots of ripe tomatoes. So enjoy.